episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show with another uh, truly fascinating guest uh, with a uh, story that is uh, is very interesting and going to be creating a, a very unique tomorrow uh, for all of us. Um, as a little background, uh, the Aiden Meller Gallery uh, is Oxford's longest established specialist gallery uh, dealing in modern, contemporary, and old masters uh, works. Uh, today we are uh, being joined by Aiden Meller, who is the gallery director, uh, who with 20 years of experience in the art business, uh, works closely with private collectors, uh, is, is often consulted uh, by those who uh, wish to begin or further develop their collections. Uh, he's also the creator of the Aiden Meller Art Prize, which is extremely valuable resources for the development of the arts. Uh, and Mr. Miller regularly uh, has original works in the gallery by the likes of Picasso, Matisse, Chagall, uh, older works, uh, including those of John uh, Constable, Turner, Millay, and uh, was involved in the recent discovery of a collection of pre-Raphaelite cartoons for stained glass. He uh, works with various other experts in the field of uh, scientific procedures uh, to authenticate artwork. Uh, has been interviewed on a variety of current affairs shows uh, recently in terms of uh, the exhibition of Salvador Dali. But today, uh, we're going to be focusing on a, a rather new artist uh, in the, uh, the Meller portfolio, uh, and that would be that of Ada, uh, who is the world's first ultra-realistic humanoid artificial intelligence robot artist uh, who makes drawings, paintings, and sculptures. Uh, she is uh, named after the mathematician Ada Lovelace, uh, combines the latest in uh, computing, robotics, artificial intelligence innovations, including those developed at the University of Oxford uh, and Leeds University, and really represents a fascinating milestone in the area of artificial intelligence, uh, innovation, human collaboration, and ultimately uh, the development of creativity from some really novel uh, cutting edge technologies. Uh, welcome, Aidan Meller, to our show. Hello, lovely to be here. Thank you. It, it, it's wonderful having you. Um, I, I'd like to start off, though, just uh, by giving you the floor for a little bit. Uh, if you could just talk a little bit about yourselves and also your, your background. I know that, uh, that art has been something that uh, goes back several generations in your family. Uh, tell, tell us for a few minutes about yourself and, uh, and the gallery and, 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 and about uh, your history. So basically, I've been in the art world my whole life. Um, I was originally at Exeter University, but then went on to spending a whole lot of time in London and more particularly at the Sotheby's Institute. <clears throat> they were excellent at uh, giving me an insight and a bird's eye view of the art world. And uh, for the last 20 odd years, I've had a gallery based in Oxford, but also reaching very much internationally uh, because of the type of work that we do. And the thing that we're specialist in is provenance. Uh, people want to know when they buy a Picasso, it's a real one. And so it's kind of important. <laughs> and <Sure>. so <laughs> uh, we spend a lot of time with academic researchers in the Bodleian and the Sackler libraries, building up portfolios of provenance for specific artworks. So understanding where an artwork came from, what it's about, and uh, where it was shown and seen is, is critically important to the, the importance of that artwork. Um, and it was actually very much being, you know, our specialism is modernism, so School of Paris and modern British. So Picasso Matisse Gall for the School of Paris side and the St. Ives, Hepworth Moore, uh, Alfred Wallace, etc. all the, 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 the usual guys from the modern British. So there are two specialisms, although as you've already said, we uh, have dealt with Constable and Turner and, and all the works as, as well as contemporary, Hearst and Emin and Coons, mm -hmm. we, we've had those in the gallery too, but uh, our primary focus has been modernism. And it was really actually being in the gallery with these modernist giants that I had a very strange moment. I had a uh, artist coming in to show their wares, a really lovely guy, he was super talented, he had incredible ability and something inside me just felt pain for this artist because he was super capable, super talented. And yet I knew he probably wasn't gonna do that well. 
and we actually said no to him as well even though he was there he was technically competent he had some great ideas but i just thought he's not gonna it's not got the 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 sparkle dust that you need to go all the way but actually it was that question what is it that about these artists that really succeed in a massive way what is it about the one percent of artists that take 90 percent of the market what is it that there was able to are they just geniuses in their garrets is there something more remarkable than that and so as a result of that i had as i say the strange thing he walked out the gallery and i looked to my right and there was a picasso drawing and above the mantelpiece we have a, a fireplace above the fireplace was a turner drawing mm -hmm. and i was looking at both the picasso and the dra turner drawing after seeing this incredibly competent guy i thought do you know what what is it about these works? These are not technically that good. The Picasso and the Turner, they're okay, but they weren't outstanding. So it really, really bugged me. So I actually made it about my business to try and answer that question. What is it that unites all the 1% of top artists? So I went home, I got some wallpaper, I went into a spare bedroom and I got wallpaper all the way around the room. And I put at the top, like columns on a page, uh, Michelangelo, Raphael, you know, all the Renaissance, all the way down to uh, Turner and Constable, to the more uh, Picasso, Matisse, to Andy Warhol, and then the contemporary lot, Emin, Coons, Hearst, and the like. And I put at the top of the wallpaper where they were born, when they were born, where they went to uni, uh, if they did, and where, what was their first gallery, what was their first break, etc., all the way down to they were dead. And I did it in lines. So I had this a very, very unusual ability to compare Jeff Koons with Turner, okay. with Tracy Emin with Michelangelo, really unusual contrasting artists to see if there was something about what they did that was really enabling them to be so successful. What is it? Basically comparing the one percenters. And do you know what? I looked at this work and I was putting up all the history of all these different artists and really tried hard. I just wasn't getting it. I came back downstairs, very despondent, spoke to my partner. I said, this is not working. I thought I would be able to distill some kind of blueprint and there's nothing there. They're completely different. Michelangelo is nothing like Jeff Koons. Damien Hirst is nothing like Constable. So I'm, I'm giving up. And she says, well, you're just not asking the right questions. And I felt so frustrated, you know, she, she was right. I, 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 I somehow wasn't getting to the bottom of this. So with a heavy heart, I went back upstairs and looked at it again. And do you know what? What is the question that I'm not asking? I looked at their artwork. I looked at their uh, social economic background. I looked at their brilliance. You know, there's so many things about them that I thought, were interesting to compare but none of them gave an insight until suddenly it, a penny dropped do you know what i haven't compared the audiences mm -hmm. the people who actually look at the artwork it wasn't a, a, an obvious thing to do right. so who was looking at michelangelo who was looking at the works by picasso who was looking at the works by jeff coons who are they that are having this response so as i compared the audiences i had that fantastic rush and realization that actually the audiences were all doing the same thing there was something that united all the one percent and that was they dealt with issues of their day the difficult mm. undercurrents the zeitgeist if you will the problems of the day that so therefore when they looked at the artwork they went yes that's how we feel mm. So I suddenly realized, really big insight, that actually it wasn't about genius artists in their towers. It was actually genius artists that were distilling where people were at. So when they put it out there, it was already in society. They just picked up on the nerve that mm. was really, and that's why they became famous. And so it was like, wow, that's such an incredible thing to realize. So it wasn't just them thinking, oh, this is a good idea. I'll go away and paint or sculpt that. It was the fact that they were picking up on something that was a deep concern. So when you look at, you know, Turner and the rise of the factories and the mills, or you go and look at 
uh, Damien Hurst and the rise of mass media and advertising. These are the issues of their day. You know, Warhol for consumerism, Michelangelo for the Medicis, whatever it is, it was they were dealing with stuff that made people uncomfortable, wanted answers, were wanting to try and understand it. And the artist gave them that conduit channel in which to discuss that. And so with that realization, I then went to a second stage and that was, well, if that's the case, what is the issues of the 2020s? Mm -hmm. What is the thing that people are really grappling with, struggling with, finding challenging? And so I decided to do a second project and that is to read about the near future. So I read 22 books from different experts, from different insights to see how they understood the the 2020s and they gave such different insights and they completely disagreed with each other and it was a real nightmare <laughs> so I did the same thing I compared them and I tried to pull on what was the thing that drew them together what was the thing that they unanimously agreed on and so with that there was one thing there was lots of it that they disagreed on but there was one thing that they absolutely agreed on and that was the rise of machine learning artificial intelligence and then the application to society disrupting all areas of society and I realized just reading hugely like I did that the 2020s is going to be a decade of lots of uh, uh, disruption of lots of um, different technologies coming in used in lots of remarkable ways and which is going to have a massive morphing of society by the end of the decade and I realized that this is quite concerning. In fact, the more I read then the normal newspapers, the more I realized that people are really worried about this. And actually, the more I read about the technology, the more I became worried about this. I realized actually we're not that far from 1984 and Brave New World. They were written by Orwell and Huxley in the 30s and 40s at the time of massive technological change. And I realized that the 1930s and 40s were actually very similar to the 2020s in some respects, in the respect that the technology changes were dramatically affecting the world in which they lived. And of course, we know what happened. It ended up in world war and the technology used as a way of uh, putting the other down and the devastation of that. So I actually became very concerned that we were, the fiction of Orwell was becoming the fact of the 2020s. And so with that, and seeing the politics and all the things that were coming through, the, the, double, the double speak and the thought, you know, or the concept of truth, all of these things that were flavors of 1984 were very much here. And so with that concern, I was playing Lego with my son he made a little robot out of Lego and he was showing it me and I just had that spark for myself. Is it possible to create an artificially intelligent robot that produced artificially intelligent artwork that commented on the rise of artificial intelligence, commented on the way that technology is going to change society? And with that, I went and spoke to lots of different robots companies. I eventually came across Engineered Arts, which are based in Cornwall, a fantastic company. And it's with that, I thought, do you know what? Actually, this is possible. This is astonishing step in giving insight and engagement to the issues of today. And so over a two year period, we got a bespoke robot made. We then got um, programmers from Oxford University. I'm obviously right next to Oxford, so that was quite helpful in speaking with the machine learning department there and they came on board and that was really exciting to go and create creative algorithms so uh, we decided to call her as a team or built a team male and female and the team were unanimous in that she should be female and unanimous that she should be called Ada after Ada mm -hmm. Lovelace this remarkable mathematician in the 1830s uh, who began the very first computer program in fact so that was a very good example. And with that, um, we started to put a, this quite a significant team together to be able to make her creative. And she has now created this humanoid, ultra realistic humanoid robot artist. And we launched her in 2019 and the, the media have been crazy over it. I mean, oh my goodness. And in fact, it was pretty overwhelming we, just for her first show that we did at Oxford University last summer. 
we had over 900 publications cover her. We had everybody who was anybody in the press want, wanting to interview her, which of course YouTube is now full of. Uh, and it's just an uh, incredible uh, exposure. It, you know, we felt pretty overwhelmed with the interest in her. Mm -hmm. um, and they, you know, I asked them, what, what is it about Ada that has really caught your imagination? And uh, they said, well, because we, we thought robots were going to do maybe Amazon logistics. We didn't expect them to be coming into the creative field of a human field. And so they felt the discomfort of that. And so the theory that I had in my spare room became very much reality. It actually was why artists explode onto the scene because it was indeed dealing with those difficult issues. And so the goal of the project, we've now, I'm now very much focused on um, this project and there's quite a few of us, as I say, involved with developing her in, uh, and make, having greater capabilities for her to do incredible artworks mm -hmm. and it's a very exciting time but the goal is to explore the issues of today the the, the use of technology the abuse of technology I, I don't have much faith in the human nature to be able to use some of these powerful technologies in a safe way and so to actually have an independent project which actually comments on that and critiques that is very exciting how's really? that for introduction <laughs> no it's, it's wonderful yeah you, you went through a couple of my questions already but it's a it's a great way to lay the uh, the groundwork for uh, where it is going um so yeah I mean, these other things that you point out especially in terms of you know you you reading these uh this futurism literature about what's coming and we've you know AI has been a hot topic uh, all over the place. We've done several shows from everything from uh, spice uh, mixtures uh, to whiskey production to, to pharmaceuticals that are using uh, AI to craft uh, uh, new, new drugs and so forth. Um, when it comes to art, uh, and especially, uh, as you were saying, sort of tapping into this 2021, these, these themes that are in front of us all. Um, could you talk a little bit about sort of what you feed into Ada to, let's say crunch, <laughs> just like the, uh, uh, the drug company will feed in uh, chemical formulations and the whiskey company will feed in these flavor profiles. What do you feed her in the sense? Yeah, how, does, how does it work? How, yeah. how is it possible that she can do these paintings and drawings? It's true. Um, it's actually a very simple process. We looked at how humans create art. Yeah. And so most humans or a lot of humans, they look through their eyes, at the, a scene that they want to capture, whether that be a portraiture or a landscape or still life or whatever it is they're looking at. And so she has cameras in her eyes. Mm -hmm. So she looks, she is looking at you. She is taking you in. And that then gets captured as an image onto the computer vision. An algorithm then interrogates that image in a layering process. And then that gets eventually translated into real-time coordinates that then translates to the arm, which enables her to have the ability to <clears throat> have coordinates in which she can then draw or paint. And the key thing is, is that it's different every time. We, we, what we were very concerned that it was a highly creative process, that it's no, not a printer, it's not any, she doesn't do the same thing twice. In fact, she can't do the same thing twice. So even if she had the same image, she would create different results. And if you have a look on Google, you'll see the images and paintings and sculptures she's done, and you'll see that they're very expressionistic. They're very abstract in some respects, but also uh, tighter in others. She, she does vary. But the key is that she has this ability to evoke an emotion within the work. Even though she has no emotion, she is a machine. She isn't sentient. She isn't um, uh, conscious. However, the artworks that she creates are quite expressionate and people are really reacted to that. And they're quite uncanny. They're very broken. They're very shattered in their looks. And we've done that as a, as a part of the algorithm build. But as I say, each output is completely different. So it's quite an exciting, we, we're looking over her shoulders to what she's doing uh, when she does her artwork. And, and do you feed her a sort of a range of uh, obviously, you know, I sit here in the U.S. and, and we're a pretty divided uh, country nowadays, uh, depending on what theme you throw out there. But, you know, just like, uh, you know, uh, if it was whatever, how many hundred years ago, if, if, if she was, 
down the street at the, at the say the Philadelphia Museum of Art here, and we have images of uh, crucifixions and and, and war and, and 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 everything else that may seem kind of nasty. It's it, it, beautiful art, but there's some tough themes in there. Uh, how do you balance it? Because you know, this is one of the things in the world of AI that you sort of, have, it, even though it's AI, you still have to sort of balance out what uh, the AI is understanding. And so they don't, yeah. you know, the AI ultimately well, doesn't well, think well, that. Absolutely. Yeah. No, we, we, we've, we very much, again, it's quite a thoughtful process. What is the big issues of the day? When we did the first show at Oxford University, it was actually mainly focused on the environment. And that we did these very okay. shattered artworks based on trees. Uh, we did a there was she did these incredible paintings of the sea uh, again all very in a shattered way mm -hmm. um, and what was a stunning what was particularly stunning about this show at Oxford is that as she announced her show to the press uh, Greta Thunberg was rising mm. with her you know whole environmental focus so actually the zeitgeist of the timing of that was astonishing. Um, more recently, we've got an exhibition coming up at the Design Museum in London, mm -hmm. and uh, Ada's done a whole range of self-portraits. Mm. Uh, this is quite an uncanny thing as well. She literally did look in the mirror to do her drawings and paintings of herself. Uh, so why does she? Why is she doing self-portraits? Well, it's the the world first works in respect that, that it's the first time. Um, a, a self-portrait with no self. Remember, there is no consciousness here. There is no sentience. It's a machine. And so to do a self-portrait of it by a machine of itself, it's what, why would you do that? Well, it's actually very good, again, emblematic of what's happening today. We are getting relationships with technology mm -hmm. with no individual conscience behind it. They're just algorithms running in the same way as Ada is running. Sure. And so there's not the um, um, sentience or consciousness or care or love behind that entity. And with the rise of language models, we've got these incredible language models. I'm sure you can name a whole number of them coming through. We are going to have relationships to things. Uh, Ada has this incredible language model that she is able to speak with. And you do feel like you're building a relationship with Ada. She speaks to you and we don't quite know what she's gonna say either uh, because of the language model she uses. But the language model generally means that we are for the first time in history having relationships to things. Mm. No, that's quite a shift in respect of having that personal knowledge of that and uh, technologically uh, it's almost like the, the the objects of the past, you know, when, when people uh, like your teddy or something like that, you know, people, okay. people have relationships with things, but not in this technological way. So that's that's the new step. And so Ada is saying, look, we are having increasing technological relationships to things. The, 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 the self-portraits with no self, we're having that. And so we're, it's, again, if you look, Google it, it's had quite a big media to mm -hmm. focus. And the other thing she's done is she's the world's first um, robot to create a uh, font. She's actually designed her own font. And the reason we've done that is, again, with the rise of the language models, we're going to have in newspapers and magazines and books written by AI programs. That's going to become very much the next decade. And again, we're saying, how do you denote that between a human writing and an artificially intelligent piece of programming writing it? Actually, we ought to delineate those two. We ought to know which is which and have an identifier. And we're suggesting an ethical, ethically, we should have a font that recognizes it is written by an AI so that we know the difference. And the corporations are moving very quick on that. And we're concerned about the ethical problems of that. Sure. And so when Ada presents at the Design Museum in May, again, it is highlighting not just the self-portraits, but all this font as well, this identifiable AI because of the rising relational aspect that we'll be having with technology. And I also read that she, uh, is not, it's not just the paintings, but sculpture now as well. Uh, could you tell, talk a little bit about that? Because they're yeah, getting yeah. multidimensional. <laughs> We're having some fun with that. She actually did, in her first exhibition, she did some bees. 
So, okay. you know, the busy bees because of the collapse of the bee corporations around the world that we rely on, of course. And so uh, what we did is Ada drew, um, we, 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 we made a relationship to a professor in Granada, actually, who mm -hmm. is a bee expert, astonishing. Uh, he did a sc astonishing scans of bees with incredible precision. And Ada uh, looked at one of these large scans from, of an actual bee and drew from that, was able to draw from the images. She can't draw the tiny little bee, so we had to do it from the, 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 an enlarged scan. And with that, she was able to get this expressionist approach to the bee. And we then were able to put those marks that she did of drawing and painting the bee into the 3D scan itself and manipulate the scans for her mark making. And now more recently, we've got some incredibly soft clay and she is actually putting her hands on this incredibly soft clay so that she can actually do marks with her hands. And again, that is building up maquettes and sculptures that she's enabled to do as 3D. So it is, it's pushing the boundaries of innovation for what a robot can do. And you, you mentioned the, uh, you know, obviously you, you've gotten a lot of press, uh, this, you know, uh, people are reading about it, very excited. Um, have there, has there been any pushback from certain aspects of sort of the artistic community that say, you oh, know, absolutely. sort of what you're doing is heresy and you're, <laughs> or whatever? Yeah. In fact, when we were at Oxford University, there was a whole load of Facebook and, you know, to the hundreds of comments mm. we exhibited at St. John's College and uh, the, the, there was a, almost a mutiny on Facebook about, you know, you can't have a robot doing art. This is really going to take all the artists jobs and this is terrible. And, you know, the, the, the threat of the robots taking the jobs, which is a common theme for robots. Um, and yes, yeah, she's absolutely Marmite. People think she's the best thing ever and want to chat to her and really excited by it. All think she's an absolute abomination. Need to get rid of her cl club of the club of the robot. <laughs> we don't want that. And so, yeah, she, she's she's definitely um, a. But we've got that's the whole point of the project, though. We're not here to promote technology. Sure. We're not even here to promote robots. Yeah. We're here to ask deep questions of our day as to the sort of world that we want. And we do therefore actually want the artwork to provoke that sort of conversation about that world that we're going into. Things are moving pretty quickly, as you know. Yep. And uh, the robotic world is like the computing world of the 80s. It's moving really quickly. I mean, super quickly. And so as a result of that, in actual fact, we do need to think about what that world is going to look like. And if we don't have public debate about that, it's just going to be then uh, a few people making the bigger decisions, which, of course, we don't want. We want a societal, you know, what happens when individuals make decisions and upsets countries. Yeah. We, we, we absolutely need a togetherness in making decisions. And so therefore, to have proper public debate is incredibly important. That's why we believe that Ada as a project and certainly going into the future, the relevance of the comments that she's bringing up are becoming ever more important to have that sort of public debate. And um, one other thing, I, I, I recently did a, um, an episode that touched on the topic of uh, sort of the uh, human machine collaboration and various domains. Uh, are there any artists that want to work with Ada on sort of collaborative projects? Uh, is there anything in, the, in terms of that? Yeah, we, we actually have done quite a bit of this already. Um, uh, Ada did a collaborative project with Sadie Clayton at the Tate, in fact. Okay. We were invited to the Tate Exchange as part of Tate Modern sure. in London, which is an incredible honour and privilege. And they actually made a sculpture together, literally nice. together. A, uh, Sadie spoke to Ada, Ada spoke to Sadie, and together they actually created a, a, a remarkable sculpture. So that's pretty exciting. But yeah, I, I think it's incredibly important. Uh, robots aren't completely independent. You know yeah, that. Sure. You know that we we they need to work with humans, and so and we we are under no illusion about that 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 they is an into in engagement and interaction between humans and robots. They need each other, um, and so um, despite the Terminator image that these robots right. are going a well, that's not the reality. The reality sure. is that 
they are very much reliant on each other. And so the collaborative process, which I think is a much more realistic and rea real situation is, is, is what aid is about. Yeah, I, 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 it's a beautiful example, especially you know, as it comes back to this issue of trust, uh, as you mentioned, uh, in terms of uh, we have all this fear, but if we can, whether it's in science or in terms of art and creativity, if we can have this trust, I think that gets us, uh, uh, allows us to take some interesting steps forward uh, that we might not be so reticent to. Um, any any uh, big, I, I, obviously we're, we're we're in the middle of the pandemic right now still, but any uh, new exhibitions coming up, anything online in terms of yeah, we've got some, work? We've got lots of exciting things coming up in actual fact. We've, um, we're, Ada's having a, an artist residency um, actually in St. Ives where the whole modern British art movement um, developed from. Mm. So if you're interested in how modernism came about, uh, Aid is actually working in Ben Nicholson's actual studio in St. Ives, which okay. is pretty prestigious, pretty exciting, and we're thrilled to have Ada down there. She's doing a six-week six residency. We'll definitely be putting it online. The press are going to massively go for it in any case, yeah. because it, it unites this remarkable period in the 30s and 40s that I mentioned before, with the 2020s and Ada's going to be looking very much at the influences of Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth and Ben Nicholson, obviously starting with Alfred Wallace, the whole scene that, how, of these remarkable artists that went on to produce such astonishing works in the 50s and 60s. So it's a pretty exciting moment for Ada and mm -hmm. like I say to do it actually in the space and it's actually where the G7 summit is at the okay. same time. So uh, we've already had request is can Ada be available when the G7 summit is on? <laughs> so who knows um, whether uh, Biden and Merkel or Johnson are going to be meeting her. I, I can't say that obviously, uh, but they have said that is Ada available while in St. Ives at the G7 summit. And we said, yeah, she absolutely can be. That would be a, a remarkable thing. So yeah, we'll, we'll have the publicity for the artwork that she does. She's gonna produce this inc these incredible works in the space, in the studio space. So we're really excited by that. And we've got a whole range of, um, there's about 10 museums who have got massive interest all the way from Taiwan to the Middle East and to America. So uh, as soon as we're able to travel safely and securely, uh, Ada will be traveling around the world. Uh, she's got a lot of invites to fulfill now. And uh, they're concertina. They were invites before the pandemic that obviously then had to be postponed. But as soon as we're safely and capable of moving again in a year's time or whenever it is, she's going to be doing a lot of travel. So hopefully she'll be able to uh, visit where near where you are. Hopefully, hopefully it'll be yeah. exciting. Well, uh, Aiden, it's it's uh, it's been fascinating uh, uh, listening to you and, and and hearing about this project and, and really wishing you and Ada the best uh, with it um, moving forward. Uh, it's going to be exciting um, for for everybody that's going to be listening to this episode uh, on the podcast or watching on the YouTube channel. You've been listening to Aiden Meller, uh, gallery director of the Aiden Mellon Gallery, uh, Oxford's longest established specialist gallery, uh, also a developer of Ada, the world's uh, first ultra-realistic humanoid artificial intelligence robotic artist, uh, doing amazing things at the intersection of artificial intelligence, innovation, human collaboration, and creativity. Um, Aiden, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while. And uh, thanks for everything you're doing. It's really, uh, really quite spectacular. Yeah, come and see us online. As I say, she's got a website. Come and come and see what we're on, on Instagram and all the rest of it. So come and check out what she's doing. Absolutely. Will do. Will okay, do. thank you.